Uh, it says in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Do you hear what I just said? That's real clear. You know, it's so clear that the new Bibles take God out and put he was manifest in the flesh. I don't give a flip about he manifest in the flesh. I'm manifest in the flesh. You're manifest. It means no, nothing at all. 1 Timothy 3.16 took the word God out. Can you imagine such a thing? Taking out the Trinity. Now, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. It says in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Uh, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Take your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hold your place in Colossians, but turn to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's look at it again. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And look at verse, let's start with verse 1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. How did God make the worlds? How did God make the worlds? By his Son. You guys got to get with it here. Come on, answer. <laughs> he said in the end of verse 2, by whom... The Father, by His Son, also made the worlds. God made the worlds through His Son. Ver you listen. Uh, you say, well, Jesus Christ was begotten in time. No, He wasn't. No, He wasn't. Now listen. He was be he, he, I should say, Jesus Christ was begotten some back in time. I want to rephrase that. People say that Jesus Christ was begotten some back, sometime back in eternity. That's what they try to say. But actually, Jesus Christ was begotten in time by the Virgin Mary. In the flesh. But see, if Jesus Christ is called the everlasting father, now I'm going to just, re just reason with you. If you're an everlasting father, what does that mean? You have an everlasting son. You can't be an everlasting father unless you were an ever had an everlasting son. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> you, you, he was always a father. How was he always a father unless he had always had a son? Always. So Jesus Christ, when he was begotten, he was begotten in the flesh. He was through all through the Old Testament. Uh, Daniel uh, 3.25, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego down in the burning fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I see four men in, in the fire loose. And the form of the fourth is like the Son, capital S, uh, the Son of God. And all the new Bibles say the Son of the Gods. They're always trying to mess with the deity of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what to emphasize, if you want to know what to preach, just check what Satan tries to destroy in the Word of God. He's taking out the blood. He takes out the deity. He tries to do it. Just preach those things and you'll be on the things the devil's after. You just need to preach against the devil. <laughs> <laughs> he don't like that a bit. Just take those things that he's always trying to t change and preach on them. That's the thing. Now, look what he says here again. He said, by whom also he made the world, verse 3, who being the brightness, who? Who's the who? Of course, the son. Hath, remember verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he, the father, hath appointed heir of all things, by whom his son also he, God, God the father, made the world through his son, who, Christ, being the brightness of his glory. Whose glory? God the Father's. Christ is the brightness of God the Father's glory and the express image of his person. Jesus Christ is express. What's it mean express? Exact. Jesus Christ is the express image of God the Father's person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus Christ. Did you know Jesus Christ is upholding all things by the word of his power? Did you know if you ever study the atom, scientists don't have any idea what holds an atom together? You ask that scientist, I say, what, sir, what, what's holding that atom together? Well, yeah, yeah, you're having a rough time, aren't you? Because they're both going opposite direction. The thing, by all, by all common sense, things just go boom, just come apart. Jesus Christ is holding things together. You know why this pulpit just don't explode right now? And this building just come loose because Christ is holding the thing. To, he's reserving this world to the day of judgment, Second Peter chapter three. And boy, when he quits holding things together, they're going to come apart. They're going to come apart. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he, Christ, had by himself purged our sins. What are you trying to save yourself for when Jesus Christ by himself did it? He by himself purged our sins. You say, believe in purgatory? Yes, I do. Right on the cross. All my sins were purged right on the cross. <laughs> He says, when he had by himself purged our sins, what did he do after that? He sat down. He's finished. Job's all done. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Sat down and said, Lord, it's done. Salvation's been completed through. All you have to do is receive it. 
Now come back again to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Yeah, this is another place I'll quote to you. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. It says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Second uh, Corinthians 4.4. 4. Jesus Christ, the image of God, should shine into them. So Christ is God's image. So you got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three gods. No, they're one God manifest in three persons. You say, do you understand it? Not a bit. <laughs> you, you say, well, why don't you understand? The Bible says it's a mystery. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. It's a great mystery. I just believe it because God declares it. One more time, turn over to 1, Timothy, 1 John chapter 5. You know what? You know, we should never be afraid to use a verse that the scholars always criticize and make fun of and say, it's not in the originals. They're a bunch of knotheads. They never saw the originals a day in their life. And, you know, we ought to take those verses and just press them on people and just infuriate the devil. I mean, those verses are the ones that uh, it's going to convince people, and so he's going to mess with them and, and try to make us cringe under them so we don't want to use them and feel embarrassed. But over in 1 John 5, verse 7, 1 John 5, 7, at the end of your Bible, for there are three that bear record record in heaven, the Father, the capital W, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are, whew, they're one. And I, these three are one. Do you say, do you understand that? Who understands that? These three are one. You know, I can say this, I'm body, soul, and spirit. These three are one. Because he made us after his image. That sounds funny, but it's the truth. These three are one. <laughs> Now, I'm, in, I'm three of me up here looking at you. Except, see, I can't separate. They can. Someday I'll separate. When I die, I'll drop this robe of flesh and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout passing through the air. Farewell, farewell, sweetheart. I'll separate someday, but see, he can separate any time he wants. <laughs> he can just come apart and do this and do that and it comes back together. You think that's complicated. I'm going to say it. Do you know over in Revelation chapter 1, it talks about the seven spirits? Did you know there's seven spirits in one? <laughs> now you say you believe in the Trinity. What would that be called? A seven, seven Trinity? Or I don't know what in the world that'd be. What do you call that? You know an octagon. You got a pentagon and all that. What's a seven gun or septagon? It has to be sept. It'd be sept because September is the seventh, seventh month on the Jewish calendar. All right. Well, let's come back to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. We're not done with 15 yet. There's a lot there. <laughs> 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the what? The firstborn of every creature. You know what they're trying to say? They're saying Jesus Christ is the first person ever to be born. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm trying to say? You know, but that isn't what that means. And that sounds funny to say that. It doesn't mean what it says. I'll show you what it means. Look at the context. Look at verse 8. He's the firstborn of every creature. Verse 18. And he, Christ, is the head of the church, or body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn of every creature. In what sense? He's the firstborn from the dead. Right there. That's, that's what it is. The firstborn of every creature. In what sense, Lord? He tells you a couple verses later because you knew you'd be scratching your head over the thing. He's the firstborn from the dead. Now you say, wait a minute. In the Old Testament, didn't Elijah raise some people from the dead? Sure he did. Elijah raised some people from the dead. What happened? They died again. You know, Jesus Christ raised some people from the dead, didn't he? They died again. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Died again. You say, well, it's only point of the men once to die. It's a general statement. Lazarus died twice. Eutychus died twice. Jairus' daughter died, died twice. A bunch of people died twice. Dorcas died twice. You see, a lot of people, now listen. Jesus Christ was the first person to rise from the dead, never to die again. Why? That in all things he should have the preeminence. <laughs> He's better than us. He's got the right. Why should we come out of the grave and never die again until he does? Well, in fact, we can't get our eternal life out of it unless he comes up first. We, he, he has the preeminence in everything. Does he have the preeminence in your life in every area of your life? Come over to Colossians again, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, by who? Christ. Don't think it's switched. It's Christ. For by him were all things created. Jesus Christ, in the beginning, God created the heavens. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
Um, so for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He's the instrument, and they're just for his pleasure. He just created it. And Listen, he didn't create the devil. Don't say great Jesus Christ created the devil. The devil sinned. You say, well, well, listen, didn't God in his foreknowledge know that the devil w w would Satan or that Lucifer was going to become Satan? Oh, yes, God knew it in his foreknowledge. God, you say, well, then God made evil. If he knew it, he allowed it to come to pass, and that's why we're in the fix we're in. Yeah, he paid for it on the cross. Your move. What are you going to do about it? If God allowed evil to come in this world, and he did, he paid for it on the cross and died that you might be saved. Your move. You don't have anything on God. You, it's your turn now. You've got to receive him or reject him. See, he paid for what you think he allowed. See, I'm using that sarcastically, but you need to figure that thing out and get a hold of it. Verse 16, for by him were all things created. Now turn to 1 John. No, one, John, the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, 1. Now, we already quoted this, but we need to look at the verses that come after it. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was, watch it, with God. Like this, two people. The, the word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the next statement, and the Word was God. With God was God. You understand that? I don't, but I believe it. It was with God that it was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. When's the beginning? <laughs> you see? But he's the everlasting Father. Christ always was. Now look. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. There it is. Jesus, the Word, made all things. <clears throat> Remember that thing? Christ made all things. Turn to Ephesians 3, just uh, two books before Colossians. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Look at verse 9. Ephesians 3, 9. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who, God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Did you know in all the new Bibles they take out the three words by Jesus Christ? They got in there, you know what it says? Uh, hath in the beginning, uh, hath been hid in God who created all things. They stop. He said, why are you criticizing those new translations? You go to any other church and they'll criticize this Bible from morning to night. They'll criticize it ten times a sermon. Hey, nothing wrong with criticizing something that's wrong. They'll criticize the word of God. I can prove they're wrong. They can't prove I'm wrong. Listen, God created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wasn't the beginning of the creation of God, as you think. Turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. You've got to get that thing straight. The JWs and Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists get that thing all fouled up. Um, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. Now, I explained this one time in visitation one morning, and I hope I can do a good job as I did one morning, because that was a blessing. I, I said I never explained it that well, and when I get in the pulpit, I have fits trying to tell you. Revelation chapter 3, look at verse 14. You'll have false cults pull this on you all the time. Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the what? Did you know amen is God's name? We found out in the book of Exodus, jealous is, he said, jealous is his name. His name is Jealous. Wouldn't it be something to pray the Lord's Prayer and say, of course it ain't the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> but remember, wouldn't it be something to get up and say, our Jealous who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It says, he says his name should be called Jealous, capital J. Wouldn't it be something to call him Jealous? Say, uh, he's, that's what his name is. We don't think of it. Our Bible says the last verse of Hebrews 12, our God is a consuming fire. Exodus 15, 3 says the Lord is a man of war. You need to hear that side once in a while. Now he says in Revelation 3, uh, 3, 14, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. <laughs> That's rough, man. That'll throw you for a loop. Did you see that? 
That looks like Jesus Christ is the first thing God created. That isn't what that means. We saw too many other verses to know that. We know that. Now, this is one verse that's putting a burr in our saddle. To how, how are we going to explain it? We got all the verses to prove what we believe. Here's one burr in the saddle. What are we going to do? All right. First thing you say, is it an object or the subject? You see the of God? Is that subject or object? Now, look at it again. Jesus Christ, they're saying, and it is. It says, Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, let me, let me show you this. I'll give you an example. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. Is that God fearing you or are you fearing God? Pardon? Us fearing God, right? Fear of the Lord. But listen, fear of the Lord sounds like God's afraid of somebody. But it's God's not afraid of anybody. See what I'm saying? Fear of the Lord. Now, if, when you say fear of the Lord, who's afraid? We are. So is God the object or subject? Yeah, he's the object. You see that? He's the thing that we're supposed to fear. He's not fearing anybody. He's not the subject. He's not the person fearing somebody. He's the object we fear. See that thing? Is that how I explain it? Boy, that thing's rough. <laughs> but anyhow, he says, Jesus Christ, the beginning of the creation of God. So is that the object or subject? What it means is Jesus Christ, anything that God created, Christ began, Christ began all the creation of God. Do you see what I'm saying? God, uh, God, the first thing God created wasn't Jesus Christ. Is that everything that Jesus, anything God created was God used Jesus Christ to do it. At the beginning. <laughs> That's rough, man. You see what I'm trying to say? Let me see if I can show you another one. Who, did, who wrote some scriptures down in your Bible when I gave that thing one time? I know I got Galatians, but what else? What else did you write down? First Corinthians 14. What's that? What's that one say? Let's look at it. We need to get this thing straight. 1 Corinthians 14, 6. I hope this helps. <clears throat> 14, 6. What in the world is there? Oh, it's just showing that Jesus... No, I don't, I don't want that at all. All right, look at Galatians once. Let me show you one in Galatians. Look at the one in Galatians. I know the one over there. <clears throat> Galatians. Now, we're just having a Bible study tonight. We're trying to get this thing figured out. Look at the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. Look at verse 7. Galatians 2, 7. But contr now, Paul's writing, uh, Galatians 2, 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter... Is it two different Gospels or the same Gospel? It's the same Gospel. That is the same Gospel. So what does it make it? The uh, circumcision or the uncircumcision is the object. The Gospel is the subject. Now look at it again. Watch it again. I'll show you it again. Seven. But contrarywise, when they saw that the Gospel, that's the subject, of the circumcision was committed unto me as the Gospel... The subject, that's the same gospel, it's the subject of the circumcision was under Peter, that's the object, who it's being preached to. See what I'm saying? That's the object, who's being preached to. Does that make sense to you? This is the same gospel being preached to two, two different people. Peter's preaching it over here, and Paul's preaching it over here. That's what it is. Now, you, you see that thing? The gospel is the subject, it's the same gospel preached to do two different people. Peter goes one way, Paul goes the other way. You got it? Do you have any questions about it before we go on? Does that help or does that mess you up worse? <laughs> the, the, probably the best one is the fear of the Lord. That one's probably one of the best ones. It's uh, we're fearing the Lord. It's not God fearing us. And so over in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, when he says Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation of God, Jesus Christ began the, God's creation. He began it. He, he's the one that created all things. Christ began. We already saw that God created all things by Jesus Christ. All right, come back to Colossians chapter uh, 1. Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created, by Christ. Christ created all things that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him. See, he began God's creation. 
He's the beginning of the creation of God. They didn't think God created him first. Um, by him and for him, 17, and he, Christ, is before all things, and by him, Christ, all things consist. You know, when things consist, they're holding together. By us, the same thing we saw, upholding all things by the word of his power. By Jesus Christ, all things consist. That's holding together. This pulp is holding together. Not because, you know, that, that nursery isn't going to hold together because Carl pounds nails in it. It's because God's allowing the thing to hold together because he's consisting it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Otherwise, by all uh, scientific uh, data, things should just come apart. They shouldn't hold together. That nail should explode. The wood should explode. The whole thing should come apart. The atoms are holding the thing together, and that's God doing it. All right, so he says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 18, <clears throat> and he is the head of the church. That proves it's Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And he, not the Pope, the Pope's not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And he is the head of the body, the church. Now look, Where's our head right now? Yeah, you, you're stealing the punchline. They heard me teach this in the Bible study. I, 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 <laughs> you're stealing in the college Bible study. <laughs> no, no, knock it off. All right. Now, they got the right answer, but she's way ahead. All right. The Bible, where's our head at? It's in the third heaven. And the body of Christ is down here. Our head's above water. Our head's above water. Isn't that good to know? You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, see, the second heaven has billions and zillions of gallons of water out there. See, you got three heavens. The first heaven is vapor and clouds and stars and plants. The second heaven is all water. And we showed you through the book of Genesis and the book of Job, there is just water out there. I mean, liquid. And the third heaven, at the top of that water is ice, and God's throne is sitting up on top of that thing in the third heaven. And it's cold up there, but you won't feel it. <laughs> That's where time ceases. But anyhow, your head's above water, and you know when your head's above water, you're doing all right. You're all right. You might think you're drowning, but he's above water. All right, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Christ is the beginning. He's the beginning of the church. Now I'll show you something else. Turn to this. Turn to um, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 8. Revelation 1 8. Christ said, He's the beginning. Revelation 1 8. I am Alpha, first letter of the Greek al alphabet, and Omega. That's my car sitting over there in the parking lot. No, that's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus Christ is the Almighty. He's Almighty God. And he's the beginning and the ending, the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. So there's another place, the first and the last. Where does it say that over there? Eleven? Yeah, I think I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And he's not talking about being first born either. He's talking about he, he is from the, he always was. All right, back at Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Christ, like I said, he's the first, he's the beginning, he's the beginning of the church, he's the author of the church. And um, it says, in all things, that in all things Christ might have the what? Preeminence. You know, in the New American Standard Bible, New International Version, they take out Christ 16 times and Lord 12 times and take out the deity Christ about 15 times. Does Jesus Christ have the preeminence in those Bibles? You say it takes out the deity? Uh, I'm talking about it changes the deity and turns him where he's not God into a regular man at least 15 times. It takes out Christ about 16 times and Lord about uh, 12 times. And I just knocked it out about 45 times, took out the deed. Christ doesn't have the preeminence in those Bibles. You know one reason I know this is the Word of God? Christ has the preeminence in it. There's not another Bible on the market in the English language that gives him the preeminence as this Bible does. And Christ should have it. That in all things he should have the preeminence. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, in his Son, should all fullness dwell. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. Now, you think that, that's great, but watch how great this is. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ, verse 9, chapter 2. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye, that you, are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Listen, if all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ, and when you get Jesus Christ, you're complete, you don't need anything else. 
People say, well, you've got Christ, but you don't have something else. And we've got something you don't have, and let us show you what it is. Trying to give you some, something else. You know what they're trying to do. You know what the world's trying to put on you. You're complete. You don't need something else, because if you got Jesus Christ, you've got everything. How does Christ dwell on, how does Christ dwell on the believer? You know what's called over in Corinthians? The Spirit of Christ. And you know what the Bible says? Now the Lord is that Spirit. Christ dwells in me by His Spirit because He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Christ is in me, Christ is in you, Christ, see Christ is in a different place. That's a mystery. The church is a mystery. How can Christ be up in heaven and in me and in you at the same time? He is. He's in us by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You see, it's possible to get saved and not to have the Holy Spirit. You're crazy. When you get saved, you got the fullness of the Godhead bodily. and You're complete in Jesus Christ. You don't need to go looking for something else and trying to find. You've got it all. All you need is to read the book and pray and just start living for Jesus Christ. All right, now back at Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. The only way you have peace with God is through the blood. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. And uh, if, you, if you want to have the peace of God, you say, I don't have peace. Peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The result of being justified by faith is having peace. And otherwise, you know, you know what peace is? That's a military term. That's a war term. Did you know before you're saved, you're at war with God? Did you know before you're saved, you're an enemy of God? You're on the other troops. You say, where does it say that? Look at verse 21. And you that were sometimes or sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. You're an enemy before you get saved. You know, when I got saved, I didn't like to hear that. Can you imagine how much more an unsaved person would like to hear they're an enemy of God? If you're not saved here today, you're an enemy of God. You're an enemy. He's going to come back and judge you. Now, I'll show you another one. Hold your place here and turn to Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And uh, let's look at verse look at verse 6. Romans 5 verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, the Bible says that we're we without strength. We couldn't save ourselves. Christ had to die to save us. We're without strength. You couldn't save yourself. You don't have any strength to save yourself. For when we were yet without strength, you're helpless. You're a cripple. You're a blind man, according to the scriptures. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the what? What a thing to say about all the people in the world. Didn't Christ die for the sins of the whole world? You know what he just said about the whole world? We're ungodly. He didn't even blink an eye when he said that. He didn't blush. He never cleared his throat to anybody when he said something to anybody. He said, Christ died for the ungodly. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 9, much more than being now justified by his blood. You're going to get, if you want to get justified, it's going to be by his blood. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. See, you are an enemy. And you say, well, when Christ died on the cross, that saved us all. It's a blanket thing. All his, yeah, his blood shed for everybody, but it's not yours till you accept it. You have to receive it. You have to, by faith, make it, make it uh, atone for your sins. See, Christ atoned for your sins, but it doesn't become effectual until you do something about it. And what I mean do is put your faith in his son. And he said, for if when we were enemies, we were. I'm no longer an enemy of God. You know what God called? We're his friends. If you're unsaved, you're an enemy of God. You need to make peace through the blood of his cross. You need to put up the white flag and say, Lord, I want to make peace. I make that blood shelter over my sins. He'll wash you white as snow. Come back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. And so, you know what the word reconciliation means? When God takes two things and brings them together, he reconciles. He reconciles. Bringing, uh, bringing God reconciles us to God. Uh, how does it say it? Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. I want to give this clear. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and see the word reconciliation. 
You know why the churches are going to pot today? Because you don't hear words like justification, redemption, reconciliation, sanctification, propitiation. They don't preach those words anymore. And that's the words that are Bible words and salvation terms, and they need to be preached. You need to know what the word reconciliation means. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. Did you know reconciliation is always God word? Did you hear what I said? That means we're always reconciled to God. God is never reconciled to man. You say, well, I'm going to do good works and pretty soon God will look my way. He won't look your way. God, will, God, you're reconciled to God huh? through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. He says in verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, not by our good works, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That means, you, you see, uh, you got to go that way. God isn't the one that messed up. You're the one that messed up. You see that thing? And when you're reconciled, you're reconciled that direction. God will never come down. You see what I'm saying? So people say, well, if I just do this and this, if I pray real hard and cry and shed a lot of tears, God will be reconciled to me and he'll look my way. No, he won't. Come back again to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 20. <clears throat> and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He is recon he's reconciled people like that. How do you reconcile them? There's no period or even. Do you have any punctuation after verse uh, 21? No punctuation. Look at 21 again. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's God's ultimate goal with you. God wants to present you before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Did you see what the next word of the next verse is? What's the word? Condition. You say, ah, see, preacher, I told you you could lose it. I told you you could lose your salvation. You're not thinking. You're not thinking. You're just, you're just, you're just skimming across it and not even thinking. You can't lose your salvation in Pauline books. I mean, all, you can't lose your salvation anywhere in Paul's writings, Romans through a Philemon. You can't lose it. Now, now watch it. He said he'll present you wholly unblameable uh, and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. He says, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, he said, then God, you'll be presented unblameable, holy, and unreprovable. You know what he's talking about, don't you? Say it out loud. Judgment seat of Christ. You, who appears at the judgment seat of Christ? Only save people. Do you say, you mean at the judgment seat of Christ, some Christians are going to be blamed? Some Christians are going to be reproved? There's not a doubt in my mind. I preached a message on a year and a half ago, well, maybe 12, 14 months ago, that you ought to hear on the judgment seat of Christ, showing that Christians will be standing there and ashamed and embarrassed and crying over their, but they don't go to hell. They lose rewards. And many, maybe some other things happen too. You ought to hear the message. This has to do with the judgment seat of Christ. You can prove that from verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We want to present. See, I'm preaching to you so we, I can present you. He talks about the instrument of man to present you unblameable, holy, and unreprovable in his sight. Wouldn't that be something that Christ wouldn't have anything to blame you for or reprove you for? You had your sins washed and cleaned up and you had all confessed up. Now, there might be some sins you don't confess as a Christian. You say, do I lose it? No, you don't lose it. You just get them dealt with at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, well, I go to hell? No, nobody at the judgment seat of Christ goes to hell. 
Read 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, read um, Romans chapter 14. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hear the message on the judgment seat of Christ. Nobody that comes at the judgment seat of Christ goes to hell. The great white throne is something else. See, you thought they were the same. They're not the same. They're not the same. Two different judgments. Again, look at verse uh, 23. Look at 122. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and reprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He said, I'm just plumb happy God let me suffer. So I, I'm rejoicing in my sufferings. You ain't that something? He said, and brethren, count it all joy when to fall into diverse temptations. We glory in tribulations. Knowing the tribulation worth patience, patience, hope, hope, experience, experience, making not ashamed. Are you glorying in them? The Bible has a lot to say about suffering and what our attitude is in suffering. You know, I've, we've had a lot of scriptures on that the last several months. What is your attitude in suffering and going through trials and tribulations? He says, Paul, in verse 14, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Say, what did he just say right there in verse 24? Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions. Of he said, Paul said, I'm behind in my suffering. I need to catch up. Some of you don't want to catch up. To, you don't even want to get what's coming. Paul said, I'm trying to catch up on all the stuff I've missed for Jesus Christ's sake. He said, I'm trying to fill up that which is behind of the sufferings of Christ. I'm trying to serve Jesus Christ. And if I can crucify this flesh, he said, but I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. Paul said, I die daily. As it is written, we are sheep of the slaughter. We're killed all the day long. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him. You need to crucify that flesh and fill up that which is you're behind in your suffering. If Paul was behind, you're behind. Or you got the guts and you got the character enough to catch up in the sufferings you're behind on? Maybe step out and do something for Jesus Christ. Take out, take out, take out a stand for him <laughs> and get catch up on some of them sufferings. Who also, uh, who now, uh, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. A dispensation. You'll find the word dispensation in, in uh, Corinthians. You'll find it in Colossians. You'll find it in Ephesians. I'm a dispensationalist. You know why? Paul was. You know why? Jesus Christ was. Because Jesus Christ told Paul what to say. Don't be afraid. Say Somebody say, you're a dispensationalist? Say, don't even blush. It's a Bible word. Sure I am. The Bible is. You see, but I'm not a hyper or ultra dispensationalist, which is somebody that just tears out pages and says, this is, you know what I'm saying? They tear apart all your Bible on you. Hey, the whole Bible, I can benefit from the whole thing. It's not all to me, but I can benefit from the whole thing. I need every bit of it. I need it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's not all to me, but I can learn from it. He says in verse 25, whereof I am made a minister. Made a minister to who, Paul? He's made a minister to the Gentiles. Turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Very familiar passage. Romans 15, 8. Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus Christ was a minister to the who? Circumcision. Jews. Now look at 15, 16. 15, 16, that I should be minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God and offering up to the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. He said, Jesus Christ is a minister to the Jews. I'm a minister to the Gentiles. Two different ministries. Jesus Christ said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. He said in Matthew chapter 10, go not in the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. That's something, isn't it? Christ said, don't, he remember, he went, he said, uh, he said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She said, for salvation is of the Jews. That woman had it right. That had one, she was a half Jew. All right, look back there again at um, Col Colossians. Look at Colossians uh, 125. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation. The word dispensation means a dispensing. God dispensed something to Paul. And I, as a minister, am to dispense something to you. It's like you've heard of a dispensary. 
You ever heard of a dispensary? That's what it is. Paul says, where have I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and, uh, ages and generations. It's a mystery. The gospel of the grace of God is a mystery. He said, the mystery which has been hid from generation but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, in the Old Testament, Christ didn't come in anybody and stay there. You see what I mean? He could leave. Now, listen to me. He, the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. You know Saul before David, you know the wicked king before David, came upon Saul and left him and came on him and left him and Saul died without the Holy Spirit. You say, where'd he go? He went to hell. Samson, Holy Spirit came on him, left him, came on him, left him, came on He died with it. You say, how do you know? Hebrews chapter 11. He's in the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. You say, what about David? The Holy Spirit came on him and stayed on him, stayed on him, stayed on him. He died with it. So how do you know? He, remember you know what David said in Psalm 51? He said, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David knew he could lose it and never lost it. Now, that's, you got to think about that. See, in the Old Testament, he come on him and leave him. See, in the Old Testament, he, he said, I'll be with you and shall be in you, and I'll abide with you forever. John 14, 15, and 16. Now look back at verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice, the hope. We've discussed hope so many times. The hope. What is the? It's an adjective. What is hope? It has to be a noun. Adjectives modify nouns. It's not like, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I'm going to heaven. I hope I'm going to heaven. Are you, going to, are you going to heaven? I hope so. That's a verb. The Bible doesn't use it like that. The Bible, it's the hope of glory. It's an absolute thing. Then we with patience wait for it. Jesus Christ is my hope. The Bible says, looking for that blessed hope on the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the blessed hope. And it's, I mean, listen, listen to me. Looking for that blessed hope, does that mean Jesus Christ might come back? Is he coming back? He's coming back whether you believe it or not. You see, he's coming back whether you even count on it or even trust in it or hope for it. <laughs> and I used hope as a verb just there. But it's Jesus Christ, he says, looking for that blessed hope. Does that mean, I hope it won't rain? No. Christ's coming back whether you think so or not. He's coming back. It's an absolute sure thing. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 6, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast? It's not something wishy-washy. All right, back in 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, uh, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom, you know, there's seven mysteries in the Bible. There's seven mysteries. And the Bible says we're to be good, uh, we're to be a faithful steward of the mysteries God's given to us. There's seven mysteries. Do you know what the seven mysteries are? I'll give them to you again. We got it on tape. And if you want a whole message on it, we got the seven mysteries on the tape. But listen to what the seven mysteries are. Well, the first mystery would be 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, if everybody would preach that Jesus Christ was God, we wouldn't have a bunch of cults and heretics running around. Did you know that? That would clear up all kind of problems with the cults and heretics. And the next mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the indwelling of Jesus Christ in you. Do you know when you realize that Jesus Christ is in you, you'll realize you have two natures? You've got the old flesh and you've got Christ. You've got two natures that battle each other and fight each other back and forth. And then the next mystery is in Ephesians 5.32. That's the body, the body of Christ. <clears throat> and when you realize that mystery, you say, why is that a mystery? Okay, explain this. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Are you part of Christ's body? You see, he's up there. How could he be up there and down here at the same time? See that thing? That's, that's, I can't understand that. I can't understand that. That's, a, that's you and Christ. See, Christ in you is one thing, and you in him is another thing. You're in his body. You're in his body? Right? We're part of the body of Christ? That's you in Christ. And then it says Christ in you. Two different ways. It goes both ways. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ. I'm already up in heaven. You see, going to heaven, I'm already there. I'm already there. You know, when you teach the, the, the body of Christ, like I told you, the head's above water. The head's above, that's eternal security. Listen, if I go to hell, you know what else goes to hell? Part of Jesus Christ. 
Part of Jesus Christ goes to hell if I go to hell. Why? I'm part of his body. You know what you say? Oh, what do you mean, preacher? I'm flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, Ephesians chapter 5 says. You say, that's that of the future. No, it's not. I'm flesh of his flesh and bone. You say, well, I don't understand. That's why it's a mystery. That's why it's a mystery. Roman, Roman, I'm having fun. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Here's another mystery. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. A lot of people are very ignorant of the mystery I'm about to show you. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part, you see a person that doesn't believe what I'm about to show you is conceited and ignorant. He said that lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel forever? No, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. You say, God's all through with Israel. The promises to Israel now apply to the church. You're conceited and ignorant. The Bible says that God is in through with Israel in part. He's finished with until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. You say, God's going to start dealing with it. Yeah, the promises to the Jews in the Old Testament are not put on the church today. And if you think so, like I said, you're conceited and ignorant. And that's what the book said. And I told you over here, God's going to deal with the Jews again. The seven years that's called Jacob's Trouble. And God's going to deal with the Jews. And that's Daniel's 70th week. And God's not all through with Israel. That's a mystery. People can't get that thing figured out. And there's another mystery. You know what that one is? You know, if, if you believe what I just showed you, that mystery of Romans 11, you'd be premillennial. You wouldn't have a bunch of, you know what you would You wouldn't have a bunch of kingdom builders running around. Everybody trying to make the world a better place to live. You aren't going to make this world a better place to live. It's a hellhole, man. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm a stranger. I'm a foreigner. I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. And I have to have to keep my head above water to get air, man. I'm, I'm a, you know what I am? I'm a that mystery. You know, in Ro Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 17, the mystery, Babylon, Harley, she's the mother of the abominations of the earth. Mis you know what that is? If you, you know who that is, don't you? You know who Revelation chapter 17 is? You want to say it out loud all at once? One, two, three. There we go. Pretty easy. <laughs> Some of you kind of scared to get on tape. Maybe they're going to get you, huh? Hey, real clear. It's the Catholic Church. How do you know? Because her colors are purple and scarlet. Rome. Her symbol is a golden cup. Rome. The Bible says she is a city set on seven hills. Look up Rome in the World Book Encyclopedia. We got them right in the other room. You know what the first thing is when you look up Rome? It says, commonly known as city set on seven hills. Within the first two lines it says that. There are so many reasons why the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth of the Catholic Church, she is the going to be the Antichrist Church. And listen, if we preach that thing and we're afraid of it as preachers, we wouldn't have the Congress full of a bunch of knotheads like that, like Ted Kennedy and the Kennedy family trying to have a ban guns and so the communists can come in and just take over so easily. Now, I know that people say, I just want to, that's the demons in you crawling when you don't like to hear something like it. It's got to be preached. That's a mystery. And I'm supposed to be a faithful steward of the mysteries of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That's what he says. Moreover, it is required as stewards that a man be found faithful. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of the Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. There's seven of them. And I've got to preach them. If I don't, I'm a faith, unfaithful minister, and you ought to go hear somebody else. Now, there's, another, there's a seventh, sixth mystery. You know what the sixth mystery is? You know what? The mystery of iniquity. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Who's the mystery of iniquity? The Antichrist. Do you know if preachers are preaching that the Antichrist is coming, the Antichrist is coming, the Antichrist is coming? Do you know, and keep that there again, you'd be premillennial. All these people bringing in the kingdom, bringing in the kingdom, they're going to bring it in. He's going to come down and say, well, thank you, boys. Pat him on the back. They're going to get the Antichrist. Yeah, kingdom's coming, the Antichrist kingdom. They're trying to bring it. Yeah, he's going to sit right out. See, if you preach the Antichrist come, see, there's an Antichrist coming before Jesus Christ is. A false kingdom's coming first. If you preach that thing, you'd be straight in your theology again. Then you got one more. Boy, it's a good one. <laughs> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all, we, we, we shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You're going to have a change. <laughs> You're going to be up there. It's going to be good. I can't wait till my change comes. <laughs>
And I'm going to change my clothes. Again, I'm going to drop that robe of flesh. And I'll be up there and I'll have a heavenly body. I'll be with Jesus Christ. That'll be glory for me. That'll be glory. Come back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. To whom God would make known unto, uh, known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is the, of the Gentile, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then he says, whom we preach. Whom? Not what we preach. We don't preach a what. We, we, we don't preach. <laughs> well, I, well, I thought I thought I put it down. I can't say the thing right. Anyhow, it says um, whom we preach, not what we preach. We don't preach a what. We don't preach things. We preach a Christ crucified and salvation's in a person, not things. Whom we preach, warning every man. I've been warning you tonight and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, you, 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 I mean, I'm, you know what perfect means in the Bible. Perfect never means sinless. Not one time. I've told you before, remember in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 13, he said, you go tell Herod that fox that I shall be crucified, and the third day I shall be perfected. That didn't mean he became sinless. He was sinless all along. Perfected means complete. I've taught you that in the book of Philippians also. Perfect in the Bible never means sinless one time. And that's very clear to prove. Verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the judgment seat of Christ where he talked about in verse uh, 22, unblameable and holy and reprovable and unreprovable in his sight. If, it's based upon a condition, you might get reproved. You might be blamed. But if you just keep right with God and things confessed up, you'd be all right. Verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul said the power of God was just rumbling in his soul. And when he preached, God worked in him mightily. That's what he said. He preached and that thing just worked. And he said his power which worketh in me mightily. Listen, you know what raised Jesus Christ from the dead? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. You know what's good? You know I've got that same Holy Spirit which raised Christ from the dead working in me? You've got the power of the resurrection in you. Hey, according to his working which he might in his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, 19, and 20. You've got that same power in you. Listen, you get down and pray, and you get all those old, cold, dead prayers. By yourself, I mean. You get by yourself saying, Now, Lord, Lord, well, forgive me my sins. Oh, get out of that stuff. you got the power of the resurrection. There's no reason to pray like that. Say, Lord, I'm here again. This is going to have a good time. <laughs> Just be excited about your prayer life. There's no reason to be praying dead, cold, lifeless prayers when you got the power of the Holy Spirit working in your body. No reason for it at all. The Bible says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, wherein to I also labor, striving according to the working which worketh in me mightily. Any questions? The book of Colossians is written to the Laodicean church. And if you remember now, if the Laodicean church is the seventh church mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. There are se seven churches mentioned, and they represent different times and periods of the church age. Like you have the church at Ephesus. The, the sixth church is the church at Philadelphia. From, uh, that's a period of time from about 1500 to 1900. And the Laodicean church age is about 1900 and all the way up. What is characteristic of the Laodicean church age? Well, Laodicean means right to the people. That's what it means. And I'll tell you something else. He said, I would that thou wert cold or hot, but because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And the characteristic of the church age is lukewarm Christians, people that aren't doing what God wants them to do and just wishy-washy tossed to and fro. And God wants you to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And you come down there in Colossians chapter 2. Look what he says. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. Now, who is the author of Scripture, ultimately? Yeah, the, the Lord. You remember Jesus Christ, he's called the Word, right? You know the Word, and this is called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, and he has a name on his thigh written called the Word of God. Jesus Christ is that Word. Now, the, though Jesus Christ tells the Holy Spirit what to say, and the Holy Spirit told what Paul to say. You see that thing? Now, isn't that interesting? If you took the I there in verse 1 and made it Jesus Christ, it, you surely can do that for I. Jesus Christ. Now, we know it's talking about Paul historically, but that's talking about Jesus Christ doctrinally. Look at that. For I would that you knew what great conflict. That's how Jesus Christ feels about it in heaven. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. 
The Lord's tore up about this thing. His heart's heavy. His heart's burdened about this last age because it's lukewarm and not doing what God wants it to do. Now, that's an application to Jesus Christ. And there's nothing wrong with that. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as, well, hello, Lord, have not seen my face in the flesh. You've seen Lord's face in the flesh? No, you haven't. Jesus Christ is having a conflict. He's burdened. He's troubled about this last age, this age we're living in now, and you haven't seen his face yet. Now, we know it's talking about Paul, but I'm putting it to Jesus Christ. Verse 2, that their hearts... He said the people's hearts at Laodicea might be comforted being knit together in love. Now, you know, you know what's going to happen in the Laodicean church age? There's going to be a lot of discomfort. A lot of discomfort. So he prays that their hearts might be comforted. He knows the people in this last part of the church age are going to have a lot of discomfort, that their hearts may be comforted being knit together in love. Why knit together? There's going to be a lot of schisms. A lot of schisms. You know what schisms are? Divisions, a splits. In the last age, they're, they're splitting all over the place, splintering, splitting, and people can't get to get along together. That their hearts be comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of full assurance. What's wrong? Full assurance of what? Of understanding. You know what there's going to be a lot of in the last age we're living in? Misunderstanding. There's going to be a lot of discomfort. There's going to be a lot of splits and schisms. There's going to be a lot of misunderstandings. And he said, I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their heart might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all. You know, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my words. If you love me, you keep my words. You say, what is real love? It says, charity rejoiceth in the truth. The truth. That's what the truth is. You see, my fellowship, my fellowship with you is around this book. Where you go, don't have, we're not with this book, I'm not with you. All right? Isn't that right? So as long as we get along with the book, that's why we got a perfect book. That's one of the greatest things that knits people's hearts together. Because it's not my authority, it's not your opinion, a monster, hell of beans. That doesn't matter, it's the word of God, what saith the scripture. And if we can just put down our pride and submit ourselves to the word of God, our hearts will be knit. I guarantee it, they'll be knit together. That their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, comma, and of the Father, comma, and of Christ. Did you notice something there? Of God, one, the Father, two, and of Christ, three. You know what I just told you about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? God. You say, well, that doesn't, that isn't saying that the Father's less than, than uh, the Holy Ghost. That's just showing you when they mention the three, they happen to mention the Holy Spirit as being God. We know Jesus Christ is God. We know the Father is God. We know that. We know that very clearly. But here's just the doctrine and the deity of the Holy Spirit. The mystery of God and the Father and of Christ. What about Christ? Look at the last word of verse 2. Christ, verse 3, in whom? In Christ. That's why, you know, usually when you see the Trinity mentioned, it's usually the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's usually the formula. And that's the proper formula. But you say, why didn't he do it this time? Because he was going to say, in whom? The last word of verse 2 had to be in whom. It had to be in the whom it's going to be in. <laughs> and so he says, in whom, Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not the hidden wisdom of the ancients. Not the Rosicrucians. No, man. It's not the, who, the Hindu. It's not them either. It's not the Hindus or the Buddhas or, or the Hare Krishnas or the Moonies. Hey, they're so far. They're so far to the left. Jesus Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, it's, look at chapter 1, verse 27. 127. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you're saved, you have Jesus Christ in you. Now listen, if you have Jesus Christ in you, and in Christ are hid all the treasures, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, you don't need to be fooling around with something else. You've got all the access and resources to the wisdom and knowledge you ever need. You don't need to be saying, well, we've got something better than you. And this archaeological discovery will help your, you know, and this, this scholarly, the Greek, and no, it won't, man. I've got Jesus Christ. I've got all the wisdom and knowledge right inside of me. I've just got to tap the resource. It's just like having a million dollars in the bank and not having a way to withdraw or draw it out. You see, you've got it. You've got to just draw on that account. You've got to draw on it. Verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. And, and look what he says there. Well, look at chapter 2, verse 9. Look at verse 9. And for in him, in Christ, dwelleth 
How do you know it's Christ? Look at the last word of verse 8. Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what's the Godhead mean? The Trinity. The Trinity dwells in Christ's body. And then it says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Listen, now Jesus Christ is in me, and the Trinity is in him. Man, I've got some power in there, don't I? <laughs> Look what he says in verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. I'm complete in Jesus Christ. Once you've got Jesus Christ, you've got everything. You've got it all. You don't need to be seeking for some other experience and saying, Brother, you're saved, but we've got something. No, you don't have anything more than I've got. I've got it all through Jesus Christ. Look back at verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse uh, 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Uh-oh. <laughs> and in this I say, lest any man. Did it say that? Did it say any unsaved man? Are you sure? You mean it's possible for saved people to beguile you with enticing words? You better watch that thing because they're out to beguile you. They're out to get you. I watched it. Now Paul says, I cease not to teach and to warn everyone night and day with tears. And I'm going to say, why are you hollering? Because I'm concerned. And they're your sheep. And then there's wolves and sheep's clothing that come in and after you and they're going to pick you off privily. They're going to pick you off. And they've been coming and you better watch that thing. And listen, you better get steadfast in the faith and grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. He says in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Beguile. Trickery. You know what the Bible says? You know what the Bible says over in Genesis chapter 3? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. That's what he said, more subtle than any beast of the field. And he, and he tricked Eve. You know what it says in 2 Corinthians 11.3? Paul says, but I fear, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Listen, you hear what I just said? He said, I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so that your mind should be corrupted. You're saved people. It's possible that saved people can have their minds corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Second Thess or Corinthians 11.3. Now, I'll tell you something that will beguile and with you and entice you more than anything else, and that is radio and TV. I'm telling you, radio gets on there, and you know, you know why people fall for these new modern translations so easily? They fall and they just go, oh, new, 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 that's women. Buy this new thing, this new product, and new improved, <laughs> and new, new, new improved. Everybody's going, oh, oh boy, I need that. And you're so you're so gullible, and you're just you're just wishy washy. You've been brainwashed into just just taking all the new things. So a new Bible comes along, you you have no defense. You have just destroyed your defense in the Word of God. And in TV, the same the radio, TV, just advertisement, and they're beguiling words all the time, beguiling words. You buy this new hair tonic, it'll make your hair look thicker. Did you hear the word I said? It'll make your hair look thicker. Doesn't mean it is thicker. You see, they use beguiling words, and they're enticing words. And they entice, every man is, uh, is uh, in, uh, sins when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. He'll hang that thing out there. I've told you before, enticing is like taking a... Uh, Fishing, you go out there and you put that right along that log, come along right along the edge of the bank, and that bass comes out and he starts swimming. You see him to almost take a strike at it. Take it out again, all of a sudden, bam, you got him. It flickers and looks real, but it's fake. You see, if he knew that was if he knew that was fake, he'd never take it. But it looks so real and it looks so enticing and he's hungry. Listen, one thing the preacher's gotta do is make sure you're fed so you're not hungering after other things. If that bass was hungry, he'd just lay there and just go, <laughs> I think, I don't need that, I'm full. I just got done eating. Listen, that's the job of a preacher to fill their people so they're not hungering after other things. Now, the turn, um, we're gonna take some time here. I'm not, I usually don't do this, but I'm gonna run through a lot of scriptures this morning. Turn to, uh, Matthew chapter 23. We're gonna hit them fast as I can go, so you better get ready to move or write them down. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, Matthew 23 and verse 14, Matthew 23, 14, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, what a way to talk to people, Lord, he didn't have the sweet spirit of Christ, did he, <laughs> uh, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation, he said, for pretense you make long prayer, you know what, the, pretending, they're not sincere about their prayers. Oh, God, bless this people today. We love them, and you love them, and we, you know, oh, mush. 
What a bunch of slop. The guy gets up, he doesn't mean a word of it. And for pretense, making a long prayer. Listen, some of the most spiritual prayers in the Bible are short. Listen, if you're right with God, you don't have to take a long time getting through. If you're right with God, I said. Now, it might take a month to get right with God. It might be an hour every day. Then after that, it would be 15 minutes every day. Listen, I've known to get through 15 minutes where some guys took an hour to get the same thing I took in 15 minutes. Hey, if you're right with God, you can do it. Now, listen, they make long prayer. And they're making long prayer, and for pretense, they're going to receive the greater damnation. 15, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him truthful, more the child of hell than yourselves. They'd come in here, and they'll sit around here, and they'll say, oh, can I have your phone number? I'll give you a call tonight or tomorrow. They've been doing it this last week. And they'll see you, and they'll say, aha, uh-huh, I'm going to find that person, and they'll come and get you. And listen, they'll make you twofold more the child of hell, unless you're saved. And besides, they'll fool you through all kind of mushy, fake love. I mean, it looks good, doesn't it? That spinner going through the water, and it just, oh, oh that, you know, and you'll take that thing, and you don't know it's for your life. It's for your life, brother. Take your Bible, turn to Acts 20. Acts 20. And there's all oh, their prayers. He's so nice when he prays. Yeah, for pretense, make long prayer. They'll receive the greater damnation. Now, some of these people that are coming in, the, I call them buzzards. I call them buzzards. They come in, and all they do is feed off of something that's dead. You know you have to be dead for them to feed off you. If you're alive, they aren't going to get you as easy. <laughs> the buzzards come down, and they pick on the carcass. They pick on that carcass, and they're buzzards. That's what they are. They're, they're too lazy to go out and get the prey for themselves. There's some birds that are go after and kill something alive. There's a lot of them just wait for something and just feed on dead things. They're lazy. You know that's the difference? You know, you know what I'm like? I tell you what I believe. I'm, I'm like an eagle. I like to go get my own prey. You know, if you're a witness and you're a soul winner, you go out and get your own prey and win them to Christ yourself. What's wrong with these people? Can't they get their own converts, have to feed off of somebody else's? What's wrong with them? They're a bunch of old vultures sitting up there and just going, you know, big, big beat neck sticking out of that thing. <laughs> Ugly as ever, aren't they? They sit there and just look and say, hmm, there, there's an easy one. I see. The, the eagle got it and left a little bit for us. I think we'll go down and get that. They're buzzards is what they are. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. This is an admonition to preachers. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock that you, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, that's me, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Which who hath purchased with his own blood? God. You say God's blood? Yeah, when the blood was shed on Calvary, it was God's blood. Look at verse 29. For this, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves are entering among you. That's outsiders. Outsiders. You say, what about insiders? That's the next verse. But look at verse 29 again. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And you know, they're outsiders. The charismatic come in. So, oh, you need to have this experience. You need to have this. Have you got the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Oh, yeah. Have you received the baptism? Have you spoken in tongues yet? And the, the Calvinist will try to get you. The Calvinist will get you, brother. brother. And I'll say something about the hyper-dispensationalist will be after you. There's all kind of false. They, hey, the water dogs, the Church of Christ, they say, repent and be baptized, you know, and, and then you, you know all that stuff. The, the Church of Christ are water dogs. They're buzzards, man. They'll be out after you. They've already got a couple people. They've already got them. Now, we can pray. We'll get them back. We'll have to work on that. Verse 30. And of your own selves shall men arise. That's insiders. Verse 29 is outsiders. But of your own selves, saved people, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. You know, that's pride. Pride. That's people in the church that sit here and look. And they, you know what they do? They have a desire to be standing up here and be in charge. Now, when that day comes, God, if he sees that you're humble and faithful, he'll put you someplace. That's right. But listen, of your own selves, listen, you listen to me. People sitting right in this room in the next six months, next two weeks, next two years, next five days, to be drawing you away and be enticing you and start doing that stuff, you watch out for it. That's not easy to preach, but that's right. The book says it, and it happens. That happens. He said, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, watch, and remember, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Take your Bible, turn to uh, Romans 16. Romans 16. Romans chapter 16. Now, you remember the verse. We say, why are we doing this, preacher? He says, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. People are trying to beguile you with enticing words. 
words. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. Mark them. That's a commandment. Mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And what? Avoid them. He said, stay away from those Christians, even Christians. He said, what do you mean, preacher? Verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. That doesn't mean they're not saved. There's a lot of Christians that aren't serving Christ. They're just serving their own fleshly appetites. They serve their own belly. And but And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. By what? Good words. So he's not a very nice preacher. Hey, the word nice is not in the Bible. He's not a nice Christian. Good. Jesus Christ wasn't a nice Christian. He said, you generation of vipers, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? He said, you hypocrites. He said, you don't tell Herod that fox. That's what he called them. He said, watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, they're, they, 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 they're wolves inside, and they have sheep's clothing out there. Bah, bah, God bless you. Oh, yes. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let's now, as we come to you today. Yeah, that's right. They get up and pray. And say, oh, God, I love you. Do you love me? I love you. I didn't know that before. Lord just gave that to me. That's fun. <laughs> that's great, man. I, and they do it that way. That's how they talk, isn't it? There are wolves in sheep's clothing. You know what I am? I'm a sheep in wolves' clothing. That's what I am. I'm a sheep inside, and I've got wolves' clothing outwardly. Boy, you, this, see, you know what I am. You see, you know my heart, but I'm just mean as a devil outward. <laughs> Inside, I'm, I love you. I really do. And that's why I'm talking to you this way. You know what the Bible says? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, he says here, verse 18, by good words and fair speeches, <laughs> they deceive the hearts of the simple. See, they're fair and good. Well, he doesn't speak good words to us. No, and I'm not going to either. <laughs> I'm not going to. Because that's the characteristic of the Laodicean age. It's lukewarm. It's lukewarm. All right, take your Bible again and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The next page about. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. And uh, notice verse... Um, well, let's go to chapter 2. You read all of chapter 1. It'll, it'll really put it clear for you. But look at chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. That's why we have Don Edwards come to preach for us. And when I came, brethren, I came not unto you with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now he says in verse 4 again, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Enticing. I'm not trying to say there's a pie in the sky and trying to get you to... I don't make a big thing about you giving money. Just preach the book to you and God will shake you upside down if he wants to. You know what I mean? Enticing words. Listen, I know how to get offerings and build a church if I want to build one. I know how to do it. You just be nice to people. If I just tone my message down a little bit, this place could be full already in two years. But I don't want it full of a bunch of whatever, people who don't praise the Lord and have a sincere heart. I don't want that. I'd rather have half the money and have the blessings of God here any day. All right, again, look at chapter 3. Look at chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. 3, verse 19. 3, 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. All right, again, take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. I usually don't run the scriptures and hit this, just make a big list, but I'm going to give them to you. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. But he said, well, I'll read verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. These buzzards and these, these guys that come in that try to beguile you with enticing words are handling the word of God deceitfully. And he says, we're not doing it that way, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Look at, um, I already quoted to you, 2 Corinthians 11.3. Look at Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10. What is the job of a preacher, of a minister to do? Galatians 1.10. For do I now persuade men 
or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, what are you? Are you a man pleaser or a God pleaser? He said, if I should yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. A man that gets up and pleases the church because that's what they want to hear or does the way they want to do it. He's a man pleaser and he's not a God pleaser. No rewards of the judgment seat of Christ. Now take your Bible and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. These people are, they're, they're what they are. These buzzards that come in here, the ones that beguile you with enticing words are man pleasers. That's what they are. I'm just showing you some characteristics of them. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, no, that's not what I want. I want 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, look at verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, he says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. He said, but this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Our, our exhortation, my preaching was not with guile, verse, verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Look at verse 5. And for neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Well, can you imagine? Listen, I believe I can say it with all my heart. God is with us. I haven't used flattering words with you. You said, boy, preacher, you're right. <laughs> I'm not going to use flattering words. Why? The Bible says flattery worketh ruin in the book of Proverbs. You believe that thing? Flattery worketh ruin. Now, if you didn't know that, you better look up Proverbs and get a hold of that thing. That's the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he says, for neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. You see, I could just tone it down and get a lot more money in here. I don't want more money. I want God's blessing. I want God's approval. I want to be pleasing to God. That's what I want with all things. Now, take your Bible again. Colossians, um, we're well, i got to find my place here. All right, turn again then to uh, uh, Ephesians 4. Come back to Ephesians 4. I mentioned this earlier, and we preached this about three, two or three months ago. Ephesians 4, verse 14. Ephesians 4, 14. That we henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men. You ever heard of the sleight of hand? A magician, the sleight of hand, he's quick at hand. And the sleight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. They're sitting in here, why did you come, I asked him. Oh, oh I asked myself, why did what, what, you come to this church? Do you have anybody hear me ask him that? I asked him, I said, why did you come here? I asked the guys that came back here, when, we had five of them this week already. I said, why did you come, Church of Christ and a bunch of charismatics? I said, why did you come? They didn't come because they wanted to learn anything. They didn't come as uh, a, um, a, a honest skeptic trying to learn something. They came as dishonest skeptics and took notes. And then when later on they're going to take those things that Brother Edwards preached about, and they're going to take those things and contradict them and try to twist them and handle the Word of God deceitfully. That's what they're going to do. They came here and listen. They weren't interested in what the preacher was saying. They were interested in you. They're after you and they're after your pocketbook. You better watch it. You better watch that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Again, take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Some folks are, aren't here today. They're out of town. I know several folks have traveled out of town today. They need to hear this message. They need to hear this. Because they've been enticed. Some of the ones that are gone, have they been, they've been getting worked on the hardest. They've been getting worked on the hardest. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. What's expressly mean? Exactly. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, Laodicean church age, some shall depart from the faith, save people, quit living for God. What are they doing? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now you say that, that that's all unsaved people. No, it's not. They departing from the faith. You say they lost their salvation. No, they didn't. You've been giving heed to seducing spirits if you think you can lose your salvation. All right, take your Bible again. Turn to First Timothy six. First Timothy six, verse three. First Timothy six three. First Timothy six three. If any man 
any, this, I think in the original Greek it meant any unsaved man, don't you? It says here, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome W-O-R-D-S, not the teachings, not the doctrines, not the sayings, it's the words. And they keep saying, oh, but we can't trust the words. We just have the fundamentals, not the fundamentals. He said, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome, what's wholesome? Healthy. Wholesome, healthy words. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. Knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Do you see that thing? And then your New American Standard, New International Version, leave out the last five words, or four words. You know what the words they leave out? From such withdraw thyself. You know who you're, you're not to hang around with? Other Christians that don't believe this book. Do you hear what I just said? He said, from such withdraw thyself. You say, why, preacher? It says, because he's proud. He's knowing nothing. And he said, well, what do you know? What do you mean? Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He said, preacher, how can you tell if a doctrine's right or wrong? It's godly. If it promotes you to live ungodly, it's a wrong doctrine. Anything in the scriptures that promotes ungodly living is not scriptural. Anything that gives you per, uh, uh, promiscuity, is that the right word? It, it gives you a, a reason to sin, an excuse to sin, it's not a right doctrine. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness. You can check out any doctrine you ever hear, and if it once makes you want to live for Jesus Christ more, that's one that's one thing you can check it out. There's many other safeguards and ways you can check it, but if it makes you want to live for God, that's one good point for it. That's one good point. All right, again, take your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. <clears throat> if a doc, somebody's teaching you a doctrine and they have to change one word in that book, I wouldn't pay attention to the thing they said. I'd scratch them. I don't care if it once makes you want to live godly. If they change a word in that book, that ought to be a red light that comes on, not a yellow light, a red one. Stop. And I just turn around and just head the other direction so fast. If they change one word in that book to have to prove something, something's wrong, they're handling the word of God deceitfully. Now he says over here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 2 Timothy 4, 1, I charge thee therefore before God. And this is Paul talking to a preacher boy. And he says, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead of the appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be in sin in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and spiritual application. Is that what it says? It's a doctrine. It says, exhort and reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound. What's sound? You get in the house, safe and sound. Sounds healthy. There it is again. Healthy doctrine. See, if it's unhealthy, it's not the right type of doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Who has the itching ears? The teachers? No. The people that are getting the teachers. See, that, that's referring back to the people that are heaping to themselves teachers. Not the teachers having itching ears, but the people that are heaping those teachers to them. They have the itching ears. They just want to keep hearing all these truths. Remember oh, the Athenians over in Acts 17, they spent all their time uh, to hear something new. That's all they want to do. There's something new, and they're very superstitious people. Remember that thing? Something like the Greek scholars. Look what he says there in verse four, 3 again. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. That's the people, remember? That's the people that don't want to hear the doctrine. So they get some teachers that will they turn their ears away from the truth and get their ears tickled. Get their ears itched. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into the fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And that's what he says. All right, again, take your Bible, turn to Titus 1. What's the responsibility of a pastor? What is the responsibility? If God's called you to preach, you better take heed. I say this 
uh, lust by any means, they beguile you with enticing words, Colossians 2, 4. You better be careful. You'll be beguiled with enticing words. Titus chapter 1, verse 6. The qualifications of a pastor is what? If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word, the faithful word, you know what faithful means? It's consistent. You can depend on it. It's reliable. I mean, it's just not, I mean, I don't, I don't mean it's reliable to a point where you can get some of the fundamentals out of it. Brother, this thing is reliable where there's not one mistake in it. That's what I mean by the word reliable. And he said, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. I think it's a requirement for a man who's going to be in the ministry to be taught. If he can't sit down and be taught and get under the pressure of study and test, there's something wrong. I'm talking about for a bishop, a pastor, that's going to have a flock. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may, may be able by sound spiritual application, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Gain, you know what they're, you know, they're talking to you, gainsayers, sayers is words. The reason they're saying the things to you that they're saying is because they want to make a profit. Gainsayers trying to make some money out of your pocketbook. And with good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. That's right. He said that he may be by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers. Vain. Vain. What do you mean with vain? Fleshly. They're after themselves. Vain means uh, trying to get attract attention to themselves. See? Trying to attract attention to themselves. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they have the circumcision. Who's that? That's your Nazarenes, that's your Charismatics, that's your Seventh-day Adventists, that's your Wesleyan Methodists. He said, what are you talking about, preacher? You're saved by grace and you're kept by grace. But you know what they believe? They believe you're saved by grace and kept by works. That's the circumcision. They come in there and that's Galatianism. And he says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped and who subvert whole houses. See, they're going to come to your house and they're going to have private little Bible studies with you. Say, well, can I come to your house and talk this over with you? I mean, uh, maybe you can help me. He says, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for why? For filthy lucre's sake. It's, li it's not liquor. <laughs> lucre, brother, that's money. And so they're after you, they're after you for your pocketbook. They're vain. They're gainsayers, gainsayers. Take your Bible again and turn to Second Peter chapter uh, two. Second Peter two. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. And uh, this is, look at verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you. Among you. See, there's false teachers among the people outside, and there's going to be false teachers among you inside, who privily, privily. Oh, brother, do you happen to have your phone number? Can I have your phone number? I can get together with you. Can we have a good time? What's your name again? You're, and they get your name. Who privily, privately. You see, they're afraid to raise their hand in church service. Why? Because the preacher that has been taught is able to exhort and to convince the gainsayers and stop their mouths. And they don't want to do that. Hey, why not? I'm ready for it any time. Bring them on. Let's have a public debate any time. You've heard that for years, two years now. Any time they want to have it. We'll have an open public debate with any false called up here. And he says there, And there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many, not few, many. The most of the world is going to go that direction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And and through covetousness, they or shall they with feigned words, feigned, fake, pretend, with covetousness, they're after your pocketbook. How many times have you seen that in the scripture here? They don't want you to be supporting a place that's doing the word. You know why? They can't stand this place. Why? Because we're make them look bad. They're not living it. They're a lukewarm. Some of them, I'm talking about these false cults are lukewarm. And they despise, they're despisers of those that are good. There, that's what the Bible says. He preached that they're not despisers of those that are good. Look at something else. Look at verse 12. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things they understand not. 
They speak evil of the things they understand. Well, I've never heard that before. Well, I don't know what that is. That's something new. They speak evil of the things they understand not. Oh, yeah. Come back again to verse 2. And many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. How you like that? Merchandise. That's what they're after. That's what they're after. Look at verse 13. 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're either going to say, brother, let's go out for a cup of coffee. Hey, brother, you watch that stuff. You don't have to be going out with a cup of coffee. Well, I'm going to help them. You say, you know what you get? See, you think that since you've learned the Bible and you've got a big head about that book, so I'm going to help them. Listen, you just do what the scripture says and avoid them and stay away from them because that's what the book said. And as soon as you say, well, I got the Bible, they can't beat me. That's when God takes down your shield. He says, all right, you violate this. You say, but I, I can do so much good, I think I can help them. You do what God says by faith and trust him. You trust God by faith. And you know what it says there? It says they, while they feast with you, they like to take you out for a cup of coffee, piece of pie, have you over for a meal. It sounds so innocent and so nice. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling, beguiling unstable souls. I like to see you beguile some of our guys in here. <laughs> you can beguile some of the guys in here. Why don't you work on them? I wish they were sitting here. and I'd like to just preach to them in one pew. I really would. <laughs> wow, man, I would be a ball. And just, you know, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. See that thing? They're after your pocketbook every time. Every time through there. Take your Bible again and turn to Jude. Or look at verse 18, same chapter. 2 Peter 2.18. 2 Peter 2.18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity... You see that thing? You know what they're going to speak? Great swelling words. When they speak those words, it's going to swell your head. Oh, brother, if you come to our church, <laughs> there's that. If you come to our church, you can teach in Sunday, at the Sunday school. And we'll put you on a usher. We'll have you take the offering. Think, hmm. Like offering. You want to, and we'll have you play, play piano. And you can come in and you can serve here. Hey, man, you're here to wear the word of God. You're not in here at all. You know what the Bible says? The church where everybody's somebody. Forget it. We'll put a sign up there. The church where everybody's nobody. And Jesus Christ is everything. You're nobody. That's right. You're unprofitable servants. You have done that which is your duty to do. In the flesh dwelleth no good thing. Without Christ you can do nothing. We have no confidence in the flesh. And they say, oh, if you just come here, we'll make you a candle boy. And if you come here, we'll let you work and you can do this. And oh, you'll have this position. Listen, I've been in churches where every single person in the church had a responsibility and a position. And they're proud of it and they kept them for that reason. You try to win those people. Oh, they're a stuffed shirt, brother. They're a stuffed shirt. What's the problem? With great swelling words. That's right. Look what he says there. For when they speak with great swelling words of vanity. See, they're appealing to your, they're appealing to your vanity, to your ego, to self. And they're after you. And he says, they allure. They allure. There's the word lure. See that thing? A lure going through the water? Man, you take yourself a message on fishing. You guys ought to all go fishing to learn how to preach. <laughs> and he says, they are a lure through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that have clean escape from them who live in air. See that thing? Great swelling words. And they allure you through the lust of the flesh. That's why you've got to keep your heart right with Jesus Christ all the time. Listen, my wife and I were listening in South Dakota one time. So I turned on the radio and I was going. In, in South Dakota, you get one radio station in town. One. Like here. But at nighttime, you could get a whole mess up. And we were sitting there, and I just hard up for some kind of preaching. I wanted to hear something. I was just going through there, and boy, I'm telling you, it's crystal clear out there. You can get radio stations from Texas. You can pick them all up from Texas in, in, in South Dakota. It's amazing. There's no mountains in Pierre. I was going through there, and we and, I, and this guy was really coming down preaching. And I was listening, and I knew who he was in 30 seconds. I recognized the voice, and I could tell who it was. And I kept on I was going, Wow, that's good. I haven't heard anything like that for a long. She kept every every thirty seconds. Boy, is that good! And she's going. She go. She kept me. Isn't he good? And I, I, she could tell I wasn't saying too much. I said, "Isn't that something?" I just kept saying, "Isn't that something?" That, that don't mean anything, you see. And and we kept listening. And then this was Herbert W. Armstrong in the radio church. And she goes, she and she, she goes, oh, through.